Hello, um, everybody. It is Charlie here from Adventure Base. Um, and today we are going to be talking all things altitude. Um, and I've just invited the Altitude Center, uh, James from the Altitude Center, to jump on the call with us. So um, bear with me a couple of minutes while they, um, while they join, and then we'll get straight into it. Um, as always, if you have any questions during this, please just put them in the comments below um, and we'll try and get around to them as soon as possible. Um, I think the Altitude or James from the Altitude Centre has joined. Let's make sure that invites me there and able to join. Let's try it again. Always good fun connection. Hey! There we go. How are we? I'm all right, thanks. Just um, just watching it a waffle that I um, filled that. Uh, that video. Yeah, it's joining now. Ignore the first minute, and it's um, it's now that. <laughs> That's always you? the way. How are you? Yeah, all good, thank you. I know that uh, you guys are in uh, Chamonix at the moment. A bit nicer than being in uh, sunny London where we are. But yes, all good, thank you. All good here. Yeah. We have to take some of the sun. <clears throat> it's been pretty miserable the last 10 days. Not that we're complaining, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, we'd like some of that UK sun that we keep seeing on Instagram. So. Mm. Oh, my heart bleeds for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna um, um, uh, mess around too long on uh, at the beginning. Here. Yeah, I spoke about Mont Blanc uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we waffled on for sixty minutes. And the feedback was make it a little bit short. So, um, I'm going to just give you a quick intro, um, and then um, run through what we're going to go through, today. Um, and then we'll just jump into some. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so um, uh, James has got the Altitude Center, um, and he is the lead performance specialist there. Um, the Altitude Center, for those that don't know, is the UK's leader in simulated altitude, which world-class mountaineers, Olympic champion, national sports among clients. Uh, you've climbed Kilimanjaro yourself, so you've yeah. test uh, and. <clears throat> You've obviously worked with countless mountaineers as they prepare for this. Uh, who are nervous about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, is that fair? Is that right? Yeah. Sorry, I lost you on the audio a little bit, but I think that's just my headphones. But it sounded sound good. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've climbed Kilimanjaro and basically the work that we do is to prepare people for altitude, whether it's your first time going to places like Everest Base Camp Kilimanjaro, whether it's stuff in the Alps, whether it's higher um, in Nepal, Karakoram, wherever. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that all sounds pretty accurate to me. Anything high, right? Yeah, um, pretty much. Okay, fine. So uh, for anybody watching... Um, or tuned in now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask some questions, some pretty, what you'd expect to be pretty standard questions. Then we've had some questions from, from, from our community, um, specific to um, altitude. And then there we'll have five minutes at the end, which is a bit of just throw your questions um, at us and we'll, we'll kind of have a quick fire. Um, but throughout this, if you do have any questions, just, just bang them in the comments section. Um, I think Jack has mentioned that the audio was bad, but now it's better. So that's taking those headphones, obviously done the trick. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just, just fire them at us and we'll kind of, um, we'll try and pick, pick them up as we go along. Um, but anyway, enough from me. Let's, let's, we've got you on here for a reason, James. So um, I guess the first <laughs> is um, what happens to the body at altitude? 
Yeah, pretty, um, like we could do 60 minutes just on that if you really wanted to. But the um, basically the, the headline is that obviously at altitude, there's less oxygen available to you every time you take a breath in you take in fewer oxygen molecules and your body doesn't really like that because it means that you have less oxygen in your blood and it means you have less oxygen going to your brain and to your muscles. And so really quickly, and I'm sure you'll have experienced this yourself, anyone who's been to altitude, you start breathing really quickly and a bit more deeply than you would usually um, to try and get more oxygen into your body. And then your heart starts beating more quickly as well. So you'll notice that even your resting heart rate, if you're just sitting there, your heart rate just starts starts going up if you're not well acclimatized. So you notice that pretty instantaneously and everything just starts feeling hard. Um, basically, you know, your body tells you that even if you're walking really slowly or climbing a route that usually would be quite easy for you if you were just on the wall at sea level, um, that starts to feel really hard. Um, and so that's that's pretty normal. Um, but it's, it's some of the... Uh, so you say maladaptive um, things that happen with altitude that people worry about. So some of the symptoms of like altitude sickness, I know is one of the things that we're going to talk about in a bit, um, but that people start to worry about if you don't kind of acclimatize so well and if you don't look after yourself um, too much. Because the body can deal with that lack of oxygen. You start producing more red blood cells. You start adapting to, to the oxygen, lack of oxygen. But if you don't, then you start to have a bit of an issue there um, and yeah, develop some symptoms possibly. Yeah, and I guess that's, I guess, like you said, the body adapting to being being at altitude is exactly why you have world class um, sportsmen come and use your facilities because, although it might not be sustainable at that at that height, when you come back down, you've you've got more oxygen in your, in your blood cells. Yeah, that's exactly it. So if you if you train in an oxygen deprived environment, when you then and you start adapting to that to supply the same amount of oxygen to your brain to your muscles when you haven't got much available to you when you suddenly then come down to sea level and you're surrounded by so much oxygen your body loves it and and that's why people love sleeping at altitude training at altitude for for sports performance for sure yeah um and and we have with the, uh, a, a, a great deal of our clients that that come to us for the first time don't have an mountain experience behind them and they certainly don't have a lot of high altitude mountaineering experience it's quite a you've got to put yourself in a pretty unique position to um to get that so one of the questions that we constantly get asked is how am i going to react to being at altitude um and ollie and i answer that as best as possible but, but before we give our response perhaps we'll, we'll just hand it over to you i mean how how do individuals react at altitude yeah, really quite a broad uh, range of responses from people who just genetically are really gifted and can deal with altitude really well um, through to people who might suffer the effects a little bit more. I mean, some people might start feeling the effects of altitude sickness at quite low altitudes, relatively speaking, like two and a half, three thousand meters if they're a little bit more susceptible. Um, whereas other people might be able to get to five, five and a half thousand meters without really feeling too bad because their body can, uh, can acclimatize as they go. So there is, there is definitely a really broad range and it can be quite hard to tell where you fit in that range without actually going. I mean, one of the things that we can do is start to actually test how susceptible someone is to a low oxygen environment and how tolerant they are of a lack of oxygen. Um, in a in a controlled way, so so using simulated altitude um, here at the centre, um, but but massively kind of broad range of ways in which people can respond. And as I say, some people absolutely you know storm it kind of without too much uh, difficulty. Quite rare that that's the case. Most people will experience some symptoms, maybe like a headache or slight feelings of nausea, that sort of thing. Um, and some people will have worse symptoms than that or those symptoms will persi persist. So, you know, nausea maybe becomes vomiting and, and unfortunate symptoms like that. So really a big, um, a big range of, of ways in which people can respond. And that is, and that is ignoring the type, ignoring any, well, are, are you born with it? Is it just your physiology? You've got a, you, you're, you're preset to a, you're gonna react a certain way to being at altitude. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, by nature and nurture right mm -hmm. so 
there's some underlying like some people are just genetically really good at altitude it seems um but it's trainable you know in the same way as uh, some people are just naturally really good at running but if you train you might be able to catch up with them if you you know you might have some people who are naturally really good at altitude but they can train and simulate the altitude to improve their response so we'll have people come to us and we'll take them through the testing to look at how susceptible they are to altitude and it might show you know they're, they're pretty susceptible they don't deal with it well and then you know six eight weeks later they've been putting in a couple of sessions a week in simulated altitude and suddenly you know they're they're as good as someone who is uh, naturally pretty pretty good at altitude so definitely a genetic component to it but it's hugely trainable as well which is really encouraging for for us and for everyone really yeah exactly i mean it's one of the we talk about this there's, there's a there's only a couple of unknowns when you come in um, take one of our trips and let's let's take our most popular Mont Blanc one is the weather obviously we, <laughs> that's uncontrollable um, but the other one body's going to react to, um, to to being at altitude and there's a number of steps we take but before they even get to us and we when we um, uh, kind of introduce people to altitude slowly and spend a bit of time there before we go higher each time um, it'd be good to know what can people do at home what is a what is, especially for those, you know, if you're in the UK, the likelihood of being close to mountains or getting getting high is pretty limited. So, yeah. so, so what are the steps these people can take? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Mont Blanc is a classic one because obviously you, you do it carefully and, and over a good amount of time, but so many people just want to go and do it in a weekend so they don't have to take any time off work. And so you go from sea level to four and a half thousand meters and in, your body just doesn't like that unless, you, unless you're pre-acclimatized. So basically what... The, the technology that we use uses machines that take care from the room that they're in. They remove some of the oxygen from it and then feed that oxygen through some tubing. And then you can attach a mask to that tube and you can wear that mask during exercise. So you can exercise probably between two and three and a half thousand meters of altitude, something like that. Um, or you can do what we call intermittent hypoxic exposures, which are passive exposures to really high altitude. So you basically um, breathe through the mask for five minutes. And for that five minutes, it's pumping out air that's simulating up to six and a half thousand meters. Yeah, wow. And then suddenly the, the air switches and it's uh, pumping out sea level air again. So it's like a five minute on, five minute off thing. Um, basically like interval training for your heart and lungs so it's training your body to to operate in low oxygen environments and with with that you know it's a really high altitude as i say up to six and a half thousand meters so uh, that's kind of one of the one of the really good things to do for acclimatization for, for something like mont blanc or or kind of your classic five six thousand meter peaks and for people who are going even higher than that then they might want to sleep in an altitude tent because they can just accumulate so much time at altitude. So you can use the same machine and just feed the, uh, feed the hypoxic air into a tent that you then sleep in and you get eight, 10 hours a day uh, in altitude without even having to think about it. So yeah, number of different ways of doing it because as you say, otherwise you get to the, to the mountain and that's the first time you're exposed to altitude, right? So it's, um, it's, it's better to be prepared on that front. Yeah, and, you, and, you, and you're so right, people, people... I mean, Mont Blanc isn't a particularly technical mountain. Mm. There are technical aspects, but it's not particularly technical, but it is high. Mm. Uh, you get a lot of people saying, well, look, I'm just doing it over the weekend. <clears throat> and um, it doesn't work that way. Um, it, unless you're Nims, um, yeah, then he, uh, I'm sure he could probably pop up in a day without any sort of acclimatization. But, but no, it, um, and and you know we even us out here who who live here and and um, run the trips we fall um, foul of this as well. Mm. We think we're at altitude. We're not. We're at a thousand here. Yeah, Chamonix is not that high, really, in the scheme of things. Like you don't really think about it. But yeah, and 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 uh, colleagues and I mean Ollie, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago at Mont Blanc. He he didn't get his acclimatization acclimatization correct. And going up Mont Blanc, he had to turn around because actually he started having all these side effects from being having not acclimatized properly. Um, so it's um, it's something you've got to take seriously, and it's something you've you've got to give your body the time to get to yeah. ready for, not fight it. So actually, yeah. on a kind of segue into um, the symptoms, if people are being if you 
if you are climbing with us and you're wondering whether you are feeling sim uh, signs and symptoms of, of altitude sickness, what should people be looking out for? Yeah, so I guess, the, <laughs> I guess if there's a good thing about altitude sickness or, or AMS to give it its proper name is that it's a progressive disease. So you hear the horror stories about people getting pulmonary edema, cerebral edema and that sort of thing, but it very much progresses through early stages before that. So you, you typically, like you, you might use what they call a Lake Louise score to, to grade it. And you look for a headache plus one other symptom. So it'd be a headache plus some symptom like nausea probably is, is pretty classic um, at a mild stage of, of altitude sickness. And at that point, you know, we would generally say you can, you can probably manage that stage just with hydration and with managing your, uh, your, your physical load, your exertion at that point. But if the symptoms then persist or get worse, then you're starting to get into moderate altitude sickness. So maybe it's a headache plus, uh, or it's a persistent headache, which hasn't gone away with hydration or painkillers. And uh, maybe nausea has become vomiting, starting to feel a little bit of shortness of breath um, at rest even, for example. And again, kind of moderate symptoms, unpleasant, but not necessarily at the end of your trip. Um, but then they can obviously progress from there. And, and if you're dealing with severe altitude sickness, then it's uh, lack of coordination, um, you know, inability to catch your breath, even when you're, when you're resting, those sorts of things. And that's when it starts to become a real issue. So I think the, the key from our point of view and what we'd always advise anyone who's climbing, regardless of the, the type of climb that you're doing, is just to communicate with, with you guys, you know, to communicate with your guides. Because once you're, once you're there, I think people worry that as soon as they get a headache, you know, you're going to say, oh, we have to go down. That's it. And of course, that's just so far from the truth. You know, there's so much that you can still do to to look after them and, and manage it really simply just with hydration, nutrition, those sorts of things, managing load. Um, so even if you do get those symptoms, look out for them, but communicate with your with your guides is the is the big headline that I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you're so right. And look, we, we deal with hundreds of clients <laughs> we we see it all and it and I and our guides see it all as well and they know what to look out for and they know how to stop it in its tracks and give it more time so you can progress um it, it's funny isn't it it's, it's i guess it's another one of those aspects within the mountains that that really humbles you it doesn't matter how strong or how fit how whatever like yeah. your body will react to altitude as it wants to react to it um mm -hmm. in perhaps taking some precautionary steps beforehand but um, you can't just push through it because it will it, it will floor you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, and it could be different from time to time as well. So you might have gone to climb Kilimanjaro and not had too much of an issue because maybe you climbed um, one of the routes that starts low and you did it over a number of days and your body had a, had a lot of time to, um, to acclimatize while you were there. So, you know, you might have been fine, but then all of a sudden you're preparing to climb you know, same Mont Blanc in, in a couple of days, or you're going to um, South America or Nepal, where suddenly you go from sea level and you fly in and you're already at 3,000 meters, three and a half thousand meters. And just because the nature of the climb is very different, you might respond completely differently each time. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, you know, actually putting the, the preparation in before you go is, is just so important in, in that respect, without a doubt. I mean, for a scientist like you, this, this subject must be so interesting. <laughs> yeah well i think so yeah otherwise i wouldn't be doing what i do <laughs> there's just so many variables uh, yeah. okay um what what can along the along the journey you touched on it before with nutrition and hydration but when when people are beginning to feel these signs of, of altitude sickness is there um is there a is there a process that they i mean our guides will help with this but is there a process that they can follow to kind of um bring them back back on track yeah i mean for for me when i've had my worst altitude sickness i know that's been linked to dehydration and that and it was just so clearly obvious that i'd allowed myself to become dehydrated over the course of you know as quickly as about 45 minutes or an hour i become quite dehydrated and so for, for me i would always bang the drum and say look first port of call has to be hydration being at altitude is massively dehydrating um, because you lose so much moisture in your breath, 
And also when you're at altitude for an extended period of time, it has a diuretic effect. So you're going to the loo far more often as well. You're just losing water all the time. So the aiming, you know, four or five liters of water a day is, a, is a not, a, not an unreasonable guide. Um, and so I would always look at, I would always look to that as being first port of call to start reversing symptoms, to be honest with you. Um, and then from there, starting to think about, well, have I eaten? Have I been walking too quickly? You know, reflect on what you've done over the past couple of hours and see if there's anything obvious like that that can be changed. And, you know, generally it'd be reversed quite quickly. Yeah, okay. And it, it always comes up and we, all, we, we tend to advise or... Um, we tend not to, to get that, that involved in the response, but there is a medication that people refer to. What's your, what's, one, what is it? And two, what's your thoughts on it as a professional? Yeah, so the, like, the medication is, uh, is, is Diamox, to give it its trade name, or the drug is acetazolamide. Um, it, basically, there are two schools of thought, um, which as soon as you Google it, you will be exposed to how vehemently people feel on each side of the argument, to be honest with you. Um, some people say that, you know, it works really well. It seems to work. It seems to um, have a physiological effect. Like there's a mechanism for behind why it works to either prevent or alleviate symptoms of altitude sickness. And I've seen people taking it and, and feel good again, you know, really quickly. Um, the, the flip side of that is that it is a prescription drug and it's a prescription drug for uh, glycoma. And so some GPs will be hesitant to prescribe it because they think, well, it's a prescription drug, shouldn't necessarily be using it if you don't absolutely need it. Um, it has some side effects that, that people might not be aware of, um, or it can do anyway. And it is in itself a diuretic as well. So you want to be drinking even more water uh, on, top of, on top of what you're already having. So very much kind of two sides of the coin there. Um, I think the, the most important thing really when people are making a decision around that is to, to just be educated and, and decide what you want to do on that. Um, and if you do decide to take it, then it's worth having a little trial run for, for a day or two um, so that you know how it affects you. And as I say, just to make sure that you stay on top of your hydration if you do decide to take it either as a course of medication or on any particular day, that would, that would be my advice there. Yeah, okay. I mean, we, we just, just from experience, the majority of, clients that come come um come through on an, on an annual basis tend not to take medication i mean we are we, i guess most of our trips don't go above five thousand meters um we have a few elbrus um Killy, everest base camp those ones go a bit higher but we, we're not at the moment we're not pushing above six thousand meters or the super high ones and and the grand climatization process seems to work for the majority of people um so yeah, like you say, everyone's different and everyone's got this um, nature, physio physiology, yeah. them at altitude. Um, so, um, but what we see is that most people don't take it and the natural process seems to do the trick. So if you're on the fence, I, you know, our advice is don't worry about it. Everything's under control, but um, there are other steps you can take before that. Yeah, is yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, uh, what are we, 25 minutes past two, conscious that I don't want to go into my um, long waffle for an hour. Um, okay, look, let's, um, let's jump into some of the questions that were sent to us yeah. um, through social media earlier in the week. Um, and also, if anyone's watching and does have a question, just, just drop it in the comments below, we will get to it. Um, so um, let's start with Nick Edwards. He's, he's asked... Uh, if you've been at, uh, to altitude before, are you likely to acclimatize quicker, easier next time? Yeah, I mean, it depends on a, on a number of factors. Like I, was, I would probably say headline, possibly, not necessarily. So, you know, when did you go before? What's the time difference been between when you were at altitude before and when you were at altitude again? what's the acclimatization profile of the climb like i say you might not have had um any issues if you did a more gradual ascent and then you're suddenly dropped in at three thousand meters you might have more of an issue if it's a different type of climb um and then there's also what you do on the mountain which impacts it so much if you're suddenly trying to gain you know 400 500 meters a day then you'll have a hard time versus if you're trying to gain 300 meters a day uh, net so you know i think there's 
I think there's a lot of other things that probably influence um, your acclimatization on a particular trip over and above previous uh, altitude experience, um, unless it's kind of been in a in a training context and it's been focused up to that point. So if you've had, you know, four, five, six weeks of altitude training or your altitude exposure was quite recent, then probably that's that's going to carry over. Um, but if it was, you know, 12, year, uh, 12 months ago, possibly less so. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, so what, sorry, I forgot, what was the headline? Because that was a, was a lovely phrase. Oh, possibly, but not necessarily. Possibly, but not necessarily, I'm gonna use yeah. that. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, A Davies has asked, how do you train for altitude when you live near sea level? Yes, come and talk to us, <laughs> um, basically, so it's um so the, i mean the, the the only way to really prepare specifically for altitude is to be exposed to low oxygen environments before you actually go mm -hmm. and so that's where the um hypoxic generators that i was talking about come in so well so we have a we have an altitude chamber here in london um so it's an entire room with at the moment three treadmills five watt bikes in there um, and the whole room is at 2700 meters and so you can exercise at, at altitude before that and then we can also use these hypoxic generators. So delivering air through a mask, which is um, uh, low in its oxygen content and either exercising then, you know, on a turbo treadmill or something like that, or doing these passive exposures to high altitudes. So up to six and a half thousand meters with the five minutes with the mask on, five minutes with the mask off, repeating that through for kind of 60, 90 minutes. And the great thing about that one is that you can do that at home um you know we, we rent the rent the equipment out you can do that at home just while you're reading watching tv you know people are working from we've got people at the moment who are working from home at their desks in an altitude tent yeah. and okay. that's, yeah. that's that's perfect you know so so that really is is the the best way to be acclimatizing is just time in simulated altitude before you go yeah and look just having speaking from experience i've, I've done the um consultation myself Oops. And I, not that I, I've been at altitude before, so I, I knew I would be, I knew I'm okay, I'm, I'm okay at altitude. Um, but it were, regardless, it's a really interesting process. And you um, putting the numbers behind the, like all the experiences is, is super fascinating. And, yeah. and I think I've, I've always, with sport, I've always just gone hard and, and expected, um, expected to break through you know if, if it's if i'm not getting where i need to just go harder or or go faster mm. what i learned is that the altitude <laughs> or, or your testing and your and your your processes allows you to see that that's that's irrelevant it's not going to help um you you're kind of you've got to go slowly you've got to accept where your body's at at the moment and you've and you've yeah. got to and you can't you can't push you can't push it but it was a it was a really interesting process um and um uh, kind of really opened my eyes to where I'm at now and what I need to do if I want to continue um, yeah. nearing world at altitude. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, a couple of questions. I, I've, I've skipped over one. Um, Damon Hollick on this is <laughs> a bit of a plug for us. Great question. What's the latest you are running the Mont Blanc uh, trip this year? We're going as late as September, so quite late into September. Um, later than usual, but um, still doable. But uh with what's going on with COVID, we're, we're, we're pushing a lot of our trips back. So if you are interested, get in touch soon. Um, here we are, here's one um, uh, around the equipment. From is altitude training equipment becoming cheaper and is it possible to rent? I mean, we've just touched on that, but do you want to, um, do you want to dive into that one? Yeah, absolutely. Renting, um, renting the equipment ahead of trips is, uh, is is what mm, probably most people will do. As I say, we have the sensor in London, but for people who are training at home, then renting the equipment is is the way to go. Um, it's definitely becoming more more accessible in that way. And um, in terms of costing, kind of depends how how long you want to have it for. Kind of the the longer you have the equipment for, then the lower the price becomes per month, as as you might expect. So usually for for a trip that's kind of up to five six thousand meters you'd be looking at as a as a very broad sweeping statement you'd be looking at one or two months before probably 
if you can use the equipment most days um and then kind of goes up from there the higher you're going the longer you have to be preparing so uh so kind of yes and yes basically um, yeah. and it, it, it all starts with with the assessment right where are you yeah now? yeah exactly so that's that's the key really is that is that you do the the baseline assessment to understand kind of how much training you you might need to do and it's always better to do the assessment sooner rather than later because we'd much rather test a year out from a trip and say okay well we can start looking at acclimatization a month six weeks before you go rather than leave it until a month before you go and go oh do you know what we should have done this a couple of weeks ago you know um so it's always better to to be over prepared rather than under prepared on, on that front yeah okay um karen has asked are rehydration salts helpful to drop in water to keep hydrated yeah, I I think so. From from two point two points of view, um, firstly to replace the salt that you have lost in in sweat and in um, in fluid loss generally, I think that's useful. Um, and even just having them slightly more diluted than um, than they suggest. So for myself, I'd usually drop a tablet, one of those um, tablets, in like a liter of water rather than five hundred mils, as they suggest. You don't need a huge, you're not sweating masses, so you don't need to replace masses with salt, but it's useful to have. The other thing is that if you're on a multi day trip, multi day expedition, and I'm asking you to drink four or five liters of water a day, have you any idea how much water that is to drink? Just plain water. If you can put some flavor into that water with some electrolyte tablets as well, then by all means go for that because then you're more likely to drink it and you're more likely to hit the targets that you want. So, yes, I'm all in favor of that. And I'm, I'm sure you're not in favour of me um, letting people know that the huts sell wine and beer <laughs> in the evening. That's how you want to raise summits and or, 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 or prepare, trying to get like, those carbs in. Um, okay. Um, another question specific um, to, to an individual here. Um, a. Davies, uh, again, what effect does asthma have with altitude? I'm sure this is a common one. Yeah, it's a it's a really common one, and the um, the the thing that I preface everything that I say is basically the the thing to do is to talk to your GP before you head to altitude because they'll be the best place to adjust your dose if that's necessary and and make any adjustments to what you're taking. The kind of advice from um, uh, from Asthma UK is that if you have well controlled uh, asthma, then you're probably okay at altitude, and uh, actually if you have um, an allergic asthma then you might do better at altitude because the air quality is so much better there are fewer pollutants um, but if it's triggered by the cold or by exercise then you could have some issues uh, around that because obviously it is cold it's the air is thin the air is dry and you're exercising so there could be an issue there um, so again the kind of advice from asthma uk is generally to carry uh, carry a reliever at all times and make sure you've got a good supply of any medication um and to take any preventers that you have exactly as you're prescribed which is where then it's worth talking to your to your gp who knows your situation best and they'll be able to advise on any changes to your your preventative medication that you might need to take so um very much an individual an individual thing to be honest with you and then the last thing to add to that is just to make sure that everybody you meet knows that you have asthma same with any allergies same with anything like that guides need to know people on the trip need to know any anyone you can tell tell mm -hmm. okay yeah. we do just so everyone knows we do collect all this information before yeah, absolutely. but yeah you're right just tell everyone anyway um yeah that's really interesting i, I mean i don't suffer with asthma so you, you begin to understand the intricacies of the how individual it is to yeah. to everyone um attempting these things um uh, someone else in the comments actually asked the question as we were answering it so hopefully outdoors dj um that answered the question for you um final question unless anyone else has any um just stick them in the comments below but uh is eight thousand meters this is from a d oliver is eight thousand meters the real death zone or is it in fact lower yeah i really like that question um is it's an interesting one so Generally, we, we call 8,000 metres plus the death zone. Um, and that was just some term that was put together by, uh, I think, by a Swiss doctor in about the 1950s. Um, 
I think 8,000 meters has a nice ring to it, you know, in the same, you know, if physio physiologically it was actually 8,050 meters, does that make any difference? I don't know. You know, I think it's just got a nice, it's, it's just a nice cutoff. Basically, the thinking behind it is that it's any kind of level where your ability to supply oxygen is less than your demand for it. And so above that level, then the body literally starts deteriorating. Um, and, and generally speaking, you would, you would say that would be over 8,000 meters. But look, I mean, there are a number of different ways of looking at it because you have, um, you, you can talk about like time of useful consciousness, which is literally as it sounds like if, if you were to climb to a particular elevation without altitude, without supplementary oxygen, how long would you be? Uh, usefully able to make decisions and things like that. And that starts to come down from about 5,000 meters plus. Mm. Um, you have, uh, you know, you do have, unfortunately, some deaths on mountains like Kilimanjaro every year from, from high altitude related illnesses, which are very preventable for the most part, but they do happen. So could you make an argument that there's a death zone lower down? Um, but then that being said, People, there's been a, there's a study in something like 2002 where people had lived at almost 6,000 meters for two years without any negative consequences. And, you know, the, the highest permanently inhabited uh, town somewhere in South America is uh, Rinconada. And that's at about five and a half thousand meters. So I think it just varies massively. I think 8,000 meters for the death zone just has quite a nice ring to it. Um, and and yeah, you can be you can be unfortunate at any altitude on any mountain if you're not sensible. Yeah, okay. Really. And I guess it comes back to what you've been saying all along. It's individual, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's that's uh, um, yeah, um, interesting. I, I mean, it, I it most of what you've been we've been discussing today, I've I had had no idea myself. Um, so look, it's it's been super interesting. Um, I don't think any more any more questions but um thank you so much for coming on and, and talking to us about it and that's great um it'd be great to do this again sometime because like i say i just selfishly i want to learn more it's um yeah it's no uh, there's there's so much to it. it'd be, be great to have a have another chat at some stage but yeah no it's, it's good to uh good to have a chat as i say kind of so everything about altitude is so individual so the thing to do is just is to understand what your response is likely to be and to and to do something about it you know we always say you wouldn't you wouldn't train for a marathon without running so you shouldn't really go to a high altitude without preparing specifically for altitude you know and if you put it in those terms then it kind of makes sense i think so also the yeah. like you say the preparation the cost going into these trips and and look t talking talking from experience having been to the altitude center having met you guys having gone through the assessment process it is, regardless of climbing a mountain or not, it's a really interesting one to go through just to see how, um, how, your, how your body reacts. And, and I, I really do, well, we do here at Adventure Base, recommend reaching out to you guys at the Altitude Center and, um, and trying, to, trying to, to, to grab one of those assessments because it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating process. And um, like I say, you will be tempted to try and beat science, but you will lose. Um, as I found out um, during my assessment. But um, yeah, thank you very much, James. Uh, that's great. Yeah. And we'll, we'll set this up again. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Great to speak to you. Catch well, you soon. In as well. Cheers, guys. See you soon. Bye.